The typical tools that we use in an electronics laboratory are an oscilloscope, a power supply, and a function generator. You could think of an oscilloscope as a multimeter that records voltage very quickly and plots a graph of it. A power supply gives you uh, variable voltages with controllable current, and a function generator can make things like sine waves and triangle waves and square waves inputs to a circuit that you build. And maybe the circuit then generates voltages that your oscilloscope uh, can show to see what's happening. When we're not in the lab, we need a uh, portable kit to help us build those things. So that's where the N-scope comes in. The N-scope is a br USB and breadboardable oscilloscope power supply and function generator. And it takes advantage of your computer for both power from the USB cable and the screen to show your data. And there's even an API so that you can programmatically interface to the N-scope to request data and save it, say, over long periods of time or to make you know, fancier graphs and games. Now, you can get the software from nscope.org. Um, and you can get an N-scope either from um, N-labs, uh, from nscope.org, or on Amazon. Let's look at the actual physical N-scope. So the N-scope has one button on it. And that button controls the power supply. So the green LEDs indicate that the uh, USB cable is connected to the computer and the computer can communicate with the N-scope. Not seeing green LEDs usually means that your cable is not a data cable, it's a power cable. Um, so some USB cables are only good for charging things, they don't contain the two wires that do data. So the green LEDs are here to indicate, yes, uh, you're communicating. And this button can turn on the power supply, which generates positive and negative 5 volts, noted by the red and uh, blue LEDs, and you can draw up to 100 milliamps from each one. Uh, if you want, you can unplug the N-scope from the breadboard, and you can note that there are header pins sticking up from the board. That's how we are applying the voltages directly into the rails of the breadboard. And then there are eight more header pins, kind of in the middle. And so instead of oscilloscope probes and function generator wires, uh, we're going to use the rows in the channels and uh, the outputs to make connections. So what I'll do is I, I made a, a small uh, uh, wire and I'm going to plug um, from the row that says channel 1 to the row that says A1. And I'll show you how the software works and I'll, uh, I'll move this wire around as we go. So here's the Enscope app. When you first turn it on, you can see that there is a red wire that says channel 1, and it's slowly marching across the screen. It's not showing anything because, um, well, I plugged the wire from channel 1 into A1, and A1 right now is off. So I'm going to click this button that says A1 off to turn A1 on, and we start to see a small sine wave. That sine wave has the properties of uh, 1 hertz, 1 volt. Uh, it's a sine wave, and it's unipolar. So unipolar means it's all one sine. If I click the bipolar button, we change to a sine wave that goes both positive and negative and has a mean of zero. Um, if I want to change its magnitude, I can grab the slider and move all the way up. And now we get a sine wave that's going from positive and negative, say, 4.75 volts. And if I want to see it faster, I can pull the, sine, the, the frequency knob over. And now I get this is a 53.7 hertz wave. If I wanted an exact value, I could actually right click on the slider and I could say, give me a 100 hertz sine wave. But on this time setting, it's going by so fast that it just looks like fuzz. So how do I control the time scale? Well, here's the time axis, and I can grab and slide over, keep sliding over, and I can keep sliding over so fast that it almost, almost looks flat. Now, it's uh, bouncing around in time, so we do have a trigger built in. So I could turn triggering on. Triggering forces the, uh, the red line to go through on a rising edge uh, between the dashed lines. So now I'm back to my original settings. Um, if I wanted, I could take channel 1 and I could plug it directly into minus 5 volts, or I could plug it directly into plus 5 volts with my long wire. So how do I read what the voltage is on this display? Well, on the right we see a sensitivity setting, and right now we're on, it says 2 volts per div. What is a div? A div is one of these big squares. So one of the big squares represents 2 volts, and my red wire from the caret, which represents 0 volts, is 2 and a half divs. So 2 and a half divs times 2 volts per div gives me a 5 volt uh, voltage. I can move back down to minus 5. 
and now we're uh, negative two and a half divs, so negative five volts. And I can plug into ground, which will give me zero volts, and that's right at where my carrot is. So what happens when I unplug this wire and it's just hanging out in space? Um, I see kind of noise, and as I touch the wire, the noise gets really big, and, uh, and I don't touch the wire, it's not small. So when an, when an oscilloscope probe is not touching anything, don't think that it's necessarily zero volts. It's basically an antenna hanging out in space. And if I were to touch it, I'm making myself an antenna, and you know whatever electromagnetic signals are going from my body into that wire are being shown there. And this is kind of interesting. Let's figure out what that is. So I'm going to zoom in in time. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna touch it as hard as I was before. If I grip it really hard, I get a almost a square wave from plus and minus five volts. But if I barely touch it, I get a little sine wave. Um, if I want, I could zoom in. So if I have really tiny signals, I can zoom in to now it's 500 millivolts per div. And if I squeeze really hard now, I get definitely a big square wave. So if you have a small signal, note that you can always zoom in in voltage, and you can zoom in and out in time. And you have four inputs on the end scope, and each can have their own unique sensitivity. That becomes very helpful when you have a circuit that has, say, many inputs and outputs, and you're trying to track everything. So I'll go back to uh, the two volts per div setting. And I'm going to plug the wire into uh, the P1 pin. Now I will turn on the P1 output. Maybe I should go back to a slower setting. So now this is 500 milliseconds per div, so every horizontal square is half a second. And I have a one hertz square wave going on with 50% duty. That means that one cycle of the square wave takes one second, and 50% of the time it's high. I could slide this down. We're going to do 20% high. So now we see 20% of the time it's high, and 80% of the time it's low. And I can make that faster frequency, and then I could zoom in to see it again. One last thing you might want to do is x versus y, where you could choose x is, say, channel 1, and y could be channel 2. So I'll turn channel 2 on. And channel 2 has nothing plugged in, so of course it's behaving like a wire and funny things are happening. So I'll just touch channel 2 with my finger while channel 1 is that square wave going on. And we see some uh, neat diagram here. And this will take advantage of uh, at some point in the class to see how uh, an input and output are related to each other. So we'll go back to the normal y versus t sign. Here we can actually see uh, channel 2 is on. It's not reading anything necessarily. But the wires are very close to each other. So we see some kind of inductive spikes. That's kind of neat. If I touch channel 2, yeah, crazy things happen. And just remember that uh, on the x-axis, we're reading in the time scale. Right now we're on 2 millivolts per division. And on the y-axis, we're reading the channel sensitivity. And I could have independent sensitivities, 2 volts per div, 1 volt per div. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about is you can uh, say single, and the data will be collected and then freeze. Uh, it will go into stop mode. In stop mode, the data is no longer be collected. You're seeing one particular kind of screenshot. Um, if I'm in continuous and I say stop, it will just stop. A lot of times it's better to hit single twice to get a refresh of the screen. In the top right, we'd also see how much power is being used. So right now, this is a measure of all of the power the end scope uses. I don't have any resistors or any high power devices, so the end scope by itself is drawing around half a watt. Um, as you add more devices, say low resistors between power and ground, you'll use more and more power. At some point, you'll kick out off the power supply for safety reasons. So I'll turn my mode back on. And I'm going to take my wire and do something that you generally don't do. I'm going to connect it from 5 volts to ground. Uh-oh, that makes a short, right? Because 5 volts to ground with zero resistance should be infinite current. That makes us go over the amount of wattage we were using, the maximum wattage we allow. The power supply turns itself off for safety. And we see Enscope detected a power fault. I'll remove the power fault. I'll remove my wire. I'll push the button on the Enscope. We'll wait back up, and now the power is available again. Um, this is very different than a normal power supply. If you were to use a benchtop power supply and short it, well, your wire would probably fry, and you'd see the magic smoke that makes your circuit work come back out again.